I'm Dr. Frida Cruz, and you have just joined me on Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. And I'll add that we appreciate our viewers and hope you find that we carry out our mission of delivering hope, encouragement, and motivation for change, or dispense information that you can use as you seek to help someone who needs for things to change in their lives. Today, I am being joined by best-selling author, licensed psychologist, and faculty member at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, Dr. Edward T. Welch, to discuss his book titled, What Do You Think of Me? Why Do I Care? Stay with us as we seek to help you find freedom from the bondage of needing to be accepted and liked by those around you. And Ed, it's great having you on Time for Hope. Oh, thanks so much. I could say Dr. Ed, would you prefer that? I would prefer Ed. Uh, I wouldn't recognize it if you said Dr. Ed, so. Oh. You have really, really taken on something that I would have never thought about a book being written on it uh, because it's something, as you bring out in your book, that I believe everyone experiences, uh, but uh, would not have told someone that they had these feelings of inferiority or that they, they're, you know, they wanted everybody to like them or that this and, and all the things that you go, go yeah, into in your it's book. It's like you figure that this is the way humans are, so why bother writing a book on it? This is, this is the way it's always going to be. There's not going to be any changes with it, so why, why bother? But, um, but I do think Scripture says so much about it. And, and, and the reason I wrote the book was, I guess it's the way a lot of my books come. It's, it's because I have struggles. And I figure I, you know, I have tons more books to write if I keep writing about my own struggles. But this is one of the things that I've struggled with, the idea of what people think about me. The, and, and if we're in the public eye, even more so. But, but certainly, it's just everybody can locate this particular question as a struggle in their lives. You, uh, do you... Uh, are you saying, and I know you aren't, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, uh, because we'll get it out first thing. You're not saying that we shouldn't have uh, some concerns about Great question. That's a, that's a very, very important uh, how question. we relate to people or how they see us uh, or whatever else you want to add to that's that. A, that's a great question. It's a little bit tricky because, because certainly by way of God's design, we care about the opinions of other people. We care about our relationships. Rejection just plain hurts. If, if rejection doesn't hurt, then something is wrong with us. So that's just, that's just normal humanness. What, what we're after is when that normal human desire to be accepted by other people and approved by other people, when it grows and grows and grows and grows and becomes a ruling desire, um, an absolute need in our lives. That's, that's, that's our particular interest, when it just seems to be consuming. And it is so ironic, too, uh, and I've always uh, used this um, to, to say certain things to certain people, and uh, that which we fear the most we will bring to pass. And that you agree which, with me on that. And that which we fear the most will be the thing that controls us. The yes. thing that we want to run from is the thing that ultimately controls us. So Absolutely. that would work and fit right in to what you have written it about, would. wouldn't it? Certainly it certainly would. And the more we're afraid of the opinions of other people, the more we're going to be dominated, and we're, the more aware of it we're going to be every single day. Absolutely. Do you think uh, that we are born that way? Are we made that way? Does our early home environment have some, a lot to do with that? That's, um, a, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll use myself as an illustration on this one. I grew up in a family that was, that was so unusually approving. My parents were, were kind, they were supportive, they were affirming, and this is a question that plagued me as soon as I was conscious. <laughs> like, you know, in kindergarten, you know, I just scared, you know, I, I guess shyness would be the way we would talk about it then. Uh, and is it true that some people are a little bit more timid around other people, some people a little bit more bold? Could we say that that's just something inbred in, in, people's, in, in people's identity from birth? But what we do with it is something very different. And for me, the issue just grew and grew and grew. And that question, what will people think of me, became an every single day event. 
We are individually uh, the person we are uh, when we come forth. Uh, and of course, the early home environment does help either uh, reaffirm that or even take it away. Uh, I, I believe that God uh, creates uh, each one of us mm -hmm. individually. Yeah. Uh, so some come forth uh, being strong, confident, uh, and, and others come forth being timid and shy. Mm -hmm. I believe that, but uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to remain that way, does it? It doesn't have to remain that way, and, and I suspect the more confident uh, you, you think of, I don't know, you think of the movie stars or something like that that seem to be confident in front of other people, and they're always talking about how they can be so controlled by the critic, the critic, the, the possible rejection, one person who says something negative. So I'm still thinking that this is something we can dig around in all of our hearts and find it somewhere. Which, by the way, it's, it's no fun to talk about unless we can first identify it in ourselves. It's easy to think, well, I know these teenagers who struggle with these things because it leads them to do foolish things because they're so concerned about wanting to be accepted by other people. Or they, you know, they're frightened, they, they, they stay away from others. So it's easy to sort of identify teenagers as having the corner in the market on it. But, uh, but nothing, nothing happens when we turn 20 that all of a sudden changes everything. It just, we don't, be, we don't talk about it in quite the same way that we did before, but it's still, it's still there. You're talking about peer pressure. Uh, it's, yeah, when we when we think pressure. of uh, teenagers, uh, and uh, uh, as you mentioned, actually I see it as a season in their life that they pass through, uh, and that uh, they're more sensitive to peer pressure during that time. Would you agree with that? Or yeah, they they pass through, and then they move to their boss. And now their boss is the one who has that controlling influence. Will I be acceptable before my boss? And, and then you move toward marriage. And, and then your question in life is, what does she think about me? What does he think about me? And I suspect a lot of marital conflicts and a lot of marital anger is, is it's not that, you know, it's, again, you, you said it very well, it's not that we should be indifferent to the opinions of other people. It's that they grow to these, well, we use a biblical word, they grow to these idolatrous proportions and they begin to just dominate us. So we can find it in marriage and I think we find it behind lots of marriage conflicts. Again, I'll use myself as an illustration. I know a lot of times when I am frustrated with my wife, it's because she didn't accept me ex exactly the way I wanted to be accepted. <laughs> And I, since I need that to live, okay, I can't, I have to have that, then I feel authorized to be angry with her. Yeah, yeah but you don't have to. You, you've <laughs> already gotten to the place that you talk about in your book that you, you don't have to have that uh, to live. But when we do have to have it, uh, and the other person has a sense of that, they can become uh, the dominator uh, in a relationship, and we keep be having a poorer and poorer esteem of ourselves as we, uh, you know, give in and give in. That's a, a, a codependency situation, Absolutely. isn't it? But uh, don't you think, though, that, that we can find this particular struggle, what do you think about me, uh, underneath both the, both the dominator, okay, what will you think about me, and I, and, and I want to be seen as the one who is in control, and also the one who just feels utterly miserable, and like you're saying, the person who's just, their self-esteem just seems to be gone. You know, the, the same question, I think, can, can undergird both their lives. I am of the opinion, and I've said this often, and it's going to be interesting how you uh, respond to this. I am of the opinion that if we will allow it, that anybody is capable of uh, abusing us verbally, um, maybe even physically, but for sure verbally, and uh, with letting, letting us know that they reject us, that they don't like us, and so forth. I, um, so, of course, I 
I deal with boundaries and uh, mm -hmm. not ever allowing one to get there or allowing someone to do that to you. Uh, what's your response to that in thinking of, uh, what do you think of me? That's Why a good do question. I care? You're sort of taking this out. What does it look like as we grow in being able to, to wrestle with this particular problem well in our lives? And it certainly doesn't mean that we're not going to care about what other people say. I mean, we will, that's part of being human. But, and it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be silent in the face of other people speaking harshly and critically and rejecting us. It, it gives us, if you will, the foundation to make a wise decision. So, so then the question becomes, do I speak to this person about what they said, okay, or, or do I essentially cover the offense with love? It gives us that, that foundation where we're no longer controlled by what they're saying, but we're essentially controlled by the Spirit. What does love look like in this situation? Does it look like speaking out because the other person is, is doing something not only offensive, but most likely sinful? Um, do we speak out to that person, or do we, do we recognize that we have this foundation of Christ and we can cover the offense with love? So you're really saying that, uh, what do you think then about uh, if you do something, I don't, you know, that offends me or say something that offends me, uh, isn't it okay if I say that's not acceptable behavior? I, I, I'm, I can't accept you uh, behaving that way with me. That would, be, that would be one of the, I think, the various expressions of love in a situation like that where you're giving me the benefit of seeing, you're, you're, in a sense you're holding up a mirror and allowing me to see myself a bit more accurately. Yeah. Now you, you, uh, you fit that in then into this love uh, and letting them, bringing them in as part of your family uh, situation. Where you're then. taking this ultimately is, is if we're really thinking biblically about any problem in life, the, the last word is going to be Love God and love your neighbor. And what you're talking about is one of the, you know, the variations of how we love our neighbor in those situations where we're rejected. Well, it's time for a break. We got lots to talk about yet. So, because uh, you have lots in this book, of course, we will only be able to talk about uh, some of it, not nearly all of it, because it's chock full uh, of uh, this kind of thing. And uh, we will be right back. There are several false beliefs that drive us in our attempts to please those around us. Allow me to name some of them. One, if I try hard enough, I can please everybody. Two, pleasing others will make them like or view me as a person of worth. As a Christian, that's number three, I am supposed to put others ahead of myself. Four, my needs don't really matter. And the ultimate lie we tell ourselves, number five, I will feel better about myself if I keep other people happy. The reality is that none of the above is true. If you continue to believe and act on these falsehoods, you will most probably end up confused, burned out, tired, resentful, and angry, and sadly, not getting the one thing you want most, approval and a sense of personal worth. The continual craving for these very basic needs are usually created at an early age when we experience neglect, lack of affirmation, emotional or sexual abuse, and other devaluing behaviors by parents or other significant persons in our lives. When we lack self-appreciation or tend to devalue ourselves, we will seek it from those we willingly serve, who, even if they wanted to, are unable to fill your need tank. People pleasers need to recognize and honor their normal and healthy needs, learn to say no and set appropriate boundaries with others in spite of their displeasure. To escape the people-pleasing trap and become a genuine, warm, loving, and competent person will require that you get to know yourself, where you have come from, what you have experienced, what you have lost, who you are, where you want to go, what you want to gain or regain, and who you want to be. 
This can be a painful process, and I would suggest finding a mental health professional to guide you through it. Settle for nothing less than truth about yourself and others. Jesus Christ, who is truth related, the truth will set you free. Learning to re relate confidently with others has to do with our horizontal relationships. Confidence and a healthy self-esteem also require a vertical relationship with the Creator God, which includes knowing and loving Him, being known and loved by Him, and pursuing a passionate and intimate relationship with Him through prayer and regularly studying and practicing His Word. I hope by now that you're beginning to grasp what uh, we're talking about because uh, Dr. Welch has done a tremendous job of taking up something that I never expected to see uh, in a book or haven't seen in a book before now. So we appreciate you staying with us as we continue our discussion of his book, What Do You Think of Me? Why Do I Care? And uh, Ed, Three questions, you say, will help a person uh, look at this situation, look at themselves, uh, and even we might call it uh, resolve uh, or reach a point in their lives that they don't have to struggle with this Certainly all growing. the time. Absolutely Grow, uh, growing. Growing. And those three questions are, who is God? Uh, who am I? And who are they, uh, all the others, uh, the people that we're talking about that we're trying to mm -hmm. get their approval, mm -hmm. we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, get, be loved by them. And there's a word, need. Uh, and you've got the whole idea of a, that we, are a, we, see, we can see ourselves as a cup needing to be filled with others' love. Mm -hmm. uh, a, uh, we need approval. Um, we need. We want acceptance. Um, and of course, who doesn't want to be loved? Uh, we were created to be loved. Yeah. So uh, we were forged in this sort of place of love, and so it's going to seem natural and right to us. Yeah. yeah. I call it a tank, our love tank not mm -hmm. being filled, mm -hmm. and you're referring to it as a cup uh, and Or a so tank forth. or you know, something huge <laughs> yeah. that we want a lot and, of it, yes. And many people, as you bring out in your book, have, have leaking cups uh, that are never filled. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen people that I actually um, referred to or thought of as having uh, cups without a bottom that you could never <laughs> fill up their cup yeah. enough. They're so needy. Yeah. What do we do with that? That's uh, that you're getting right to I think the critical issues. Okay, so so first I want to think this is a problem that I struggle with. I can see it in teens and I see can, can see it in children, but if it's a universal problem, I first want to see it in me. So so do I care? Do I want love from other people? Do I? have that desire grow and grow and grow to the point where it becomes a need. And I, I think you said it very well. When it moves from a desire to a need, it becomes insatiable. We can never, ever get enough. We, you know, we'll, we'll get something you know, from somebody, and then five minutes later, it's, it's empty. You know, it, has to be, it has to be filled up again. And so those questions you raised are just, those are the great questions of life. I guess we can use those questions, who is God, who am I, who are other people? We can use those questions for absolutely everything. We can start with any one of them. I'll, I'll start with who is God. I have two answers to that question, and I'd be interested in your thoughts too. One is, God loves me, so why should I care about what other people think? My experience with that is it doesn't work. Uh, and I, had no, I think I had my epiphany for that when I, was, when I was a teenager. And like most teenagers, I didn't tell my parents what was going on, but they knew a whole lot more than I thought. And so I was dating a girl in high school, and I, I, I got dumped by her one night. I came home, my mom, she knew something was up, and she said, she said, Eddie, I want you to know we really love you. And that's, yeah, that's a very sweet thing to say, and she, she recognized that I was hurt by something, but my epiphany was very simple. It was, Mom, 
I guess it's better that you love me than hate me, but frankly, right now, I couldn't care because I, I care about that other person loving me. You can love me. You can, it doesn't matter what you do at this point. I care about the other person, and that's, I think, sometimes what happens in our relationship with God. God says, I love you. Okay, I love you. I love you, and, and, and I, I love you in ways that, you'll, that will take you all of eternity to begin to understand. And our response is, well, yeah, I, guess, I guess it's better you love me rather than hate me, but, but frankly, I want that person to approve of me right now. So, so sometimes I think the answer to the question, who is God, when, when that desire has become a need, is, is God is irrelevant. That's who he is, which, which shows that there is a fairly deep issue going on here. If when that's true, there would be, yep. yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and here's, I, I think, a way we make God relevant. We're here, you, you hear that, 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 that natural human tens tendency where desire becomes a demand. It becomes what we have to have in order to live, where my wife must love me. Okay, she must love me the way I want to be loved. The... The Lord never promises us that he's going to satisfy us in that way because there's something idolatrous about that. And, 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 and the trick, as far as I can tell from scriptures, is very simple. We, we confess our needs down to the size of desires. We, it's, it's, it's like a, this miniaturization process that happens by way of confession. Where, and it's the second question in the book. It, it, you know, it's, it's not just a question, it's a confession. Lord, why do I care? so much about me. Okay. Why do I care so much about me? And in that confession brings that need down to a desire, and then the love of Christ becomes very, very relevant. And in a sense, that confession, what it does is it, you know, that, that huge gaping hole in the bottom of the tank, all of a sudden it's, it's, it's filled in. Okay. And, and now, as far as I can tell from Scripture, I know you've done so much work on comfort and grief. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 has a bit of a picture of a, of a tank. And it's, it's God pouring his love and comfort into us in such a way that not only do we hold that, but it overflows the sides. And, and we, in turn, can, can offer that love to others. I think what you're describing is a foundation mm -hmm. uh, upon which to build our, you know, some have built upon sand and some have built upon a rock, their house, and w referring to us and our, ourselves. If we have a foundational, close, intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father, uh, who is the, the Creator God, who is God, uh, it gives us something, uh, a foundation from which to uh, relate to other people. It also allows us, as you bring out in your book, to share that love uh, with others rather than trying to uh, to be receivers, we become givers. Become My man. friend and I were question. discussing this uh, just recently. He's a psychiatrist, and we were discussing that most people want to, want to receive rather than give, and he believes the key is to be a, a giver rather than a receiver. Rejection hurts, but that privilege of how can I love that person more than be concerned about how they love me, too. To ha have the emphasis on loving more than being loved, that's, that's, the, that's the wonderful challenge in the Christian life. Oh, so who are they? Um, they are the ones then that God has given us the challenge uh, to reach out to and love, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, just uh, as he loves us, we are to love other people. And you actually say, uh, form a family, bring them in like a family member. And uh, so you're, you're right in that all that you're bringing out in here can be carried over into uh, any, any uh, part of our life, whether it's in our marriage or whether it's in our home, uh, uh, whether it's with our friends, our neighbors, and mm -hmm. so forth. And so it comes down to what? Uh, what Jesus said when he wrapped up the whole law, wasn't, wasn't it? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, and, it's, and it's 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 simple, but it is it is powerful, isn't it? When the powerful. Spirit gives us that power, it is a wonderful thing. Ed, you've done a great job. I think we've just 
uh, said enough that surely the viewers are going to want to hear uh, <laughs> or find or read uh, the rest because you said there are answers to the big questions in life found in your book. And I have uh, I've gone through your book and I have to, I, I, it's true. So, so much. I thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing with us on Time for Hope. Lord bless you and your ministry. And I have something to share with you, uh, so don't go away. I have a prayer request. Dear Dr. Frieda, please pray for me. I have been feeling rejected lately, and I feel like people have not believed in me since I was a child. I always felt like I have been blamed for everything and that my family is against me. I am alone and have never been married. I hope something we've shared today, and if you could get, uh, if you could get Ed's book, uh, you could find out that you're not alone, uh, and you don't have to feel alone, and uh, that uh, God is there for you, and that changes good positive changes can take place in your life. And we have prayed for this viewer as we do with each and every uh, prayer request that comes in to Time for Hope. And then a note of encouragement, dear Dr. Frieda, I really enjoy watching Time for Hope. I love to hear you talking about how you can have hope and be blessed. There are so many people who don't know God and don't have hope. The first thing you start out with, who is God? They must know who God is to hope in Him. And they let worry come right in and take over. Thank you for your program. And I thank you for sharing that, uh, those words of encouragement uh, with us. We appreciate all of you. And um, so again, I reiterate that we, we take your prayer requests seriously and we certainly appreciate your words of encouragement. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for $11 plus $3 shipping and handling. To receive the free fact sheet or our guest's book or both, you may call us at 1-800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304 or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, please prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, you can become a member of our team by sending us a financial gift of any amount. When you send your gift to support Time for Hope, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers who might believe there is no hope for their situation. And you're also enabling us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. Until next time, have a great week. And remember, it is time for hope.